Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this seminar presented by ARTA's Pension and Financial Wellness Committee. We're pleased to offer a series of financial wellness seminars throughout the year to create an opportunity for education on topics specific to retiree financial wellness. Since ARTA was formed in 1963, we have focused on supporting our members in an engaged and active lifestyle in retirement. Our holistic approach includes one of the best benefit plans in the country, as well as many additional programs and services, including our Art of Perks discount program, physical wellness events, social opportunities offered through our regional branches, scholarships for family members, and of course, seminars like this one. Arda also serves as an advocate for teachers and retirees, using our collective voice to draw attention to the ATRF and teachers' pensions, the seniors' drug plan, and most recently, the impacts being felt in healthcare in rural communities. There are many different factors that allow Arda to maintain such a wide reach, but in the end, because we were, we were created by retired teachers for retired teachers and like-minded professionals, we remain dedicated to retirees. With that, I'll pass things off to the chair of Artist Pension and Financial Wellness Committee, Ray Hoger. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Hoger, and I'm the chair of Artist Pension and Financial Wellness Committee. I'm joined today by Pension and Financial Wellness Committee members, Blair Lowry, Larry Hartel, and Craig Whitehead, and by Artist Treasurer, Lawrence Riken. As you may have noticed, we have disabled attendee video and audio capability. This will ensure, help ensure a quality experience for all participants by limiting web streaming. It also allows us to record this webinar without breaching your privacy. With your audio muted, we encourage you to use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. You can submit questions publicly so that all attendees can see them or submit them privately so only the artist staff will be able to see them. Our team or the speaker will respond to questions at the end of the webinar. A reminder for participants that this presentation is for informational purposes only and should not be used to replace a consultation with a trained legal, tax, or financial professional. Please contact a professional for financial, tax, or legal advice related to your specific circumstances. With those housekeeping matters completed, Art is pleased to present today's session, an informative presentation on the Canada Pension Plan and its history, investment strategy, and sustainability. CPP is currently a popular topic in Alberta after a report was published on the feasibility of Alberta withdrawing from the Canada Pension Plan. Arda reached out to the Alberta government to see if they would like to present on the proposed Alberta Pension Plan. Our request was received and they have not committed to participating at this time. I would like to welcome today's speaker, Jeffrey Hodgson, Managing Director of Global Stakeholder Affairs at CPP Investments. Jeremy, it's, or Jeffrey, sorry, it's all yours. Fantastic, Rick. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's taking the time to join today and to Arda for uh, providing us with this platform to talk a little bit more about what we do. Uh, coming to you live today from uh, an office, somewhat echoey office here in downtown Calgary. Um, some of you may have seen in the news, our CEO, John Graham, did a presentation. Uh, we hosted an event in partnership with the Calgary Chamber, um, the CPP Investments Alberta Energy and Growth Forum. All right, so for our agenda today, um, we're gonna to talk about two things. First of all, we're gonna talk about CPP investments, who we are and what we do. Um, and uh, well, most people are very familiar with the Canada Pension Plan and know it well. Not so many people are familiar with the entity that actually manages the money or the investment engine of the plan, which is us. Um, so we'll go a little bit through that structure and then we'll also get to the topic of the day, which is uh, the discussion around an Alberta pension plan. Now, um, starting with who we are and what we do, um, CPP Investments, we're uh, basically the, the pension fund manager that manages the, the $576 billion CPP fund um, that underpins the, the solvency of the, uh, of, the, of the broader Canada pension plan. Um, we're well known globally. Uh, many international uh, governments have sort of pointed to us as you know, our, our successful role as an independent pension fund manager. We have over nine uh, international offices and we uh, work for 21 million, uh, more than 21 million con Canadian contributors and beneficiaries. And that includes more than 2.8 million uh, right here in Alberta. 
And our purpose is very singular. It's build that you know, foundation upon which uh, those more than 21 million Canadian contributors and beneficiaries you know, uh, build a foundation which uh, that they can use to see, help secure, uh, you know, find security in retirement. Now, our objectives as a plan are pretty pretty singular, um, and they're spelled out in our founding legislation. Uh, very clear, we you know assist the Canada pension plan meeting its obligations, uh, manage our, our invest the investments. Uh, the when it comes to how we invest, what we're investing, what we're trying to do, it's very singular. You know, maximize returns without undue risks, taking into account the needs of the uh, the funding needs of the CPP. Now, um, I'd like to go back a little bit and, and people just give a bit of the history because I think it'll help uh, form the full pictures in people's mind. Um, when it comes to retirement savings, uh, most people know about, uh, you know, older than CPP was or the original taxpayer supported uh, old age security and now supplemented by GIS as well for low income Canadians. But those are taxpayer supported plans um, and, they, and they continue to be funded by uh, federal tax dollars. Uh, CPP is different. Uh, it was created a little bit later in the 1960s. Um, at that point, the uh, the federal government wanted to work with, uh, want to bring about a national uh, work release pension plan. Um, but pensions are, and this is important, constitutionally they're the responsibility of the provinces. So in order to build the Canada Pension Plan, the uh, federal government had to go and get the cooperation of the provinces. So nine out of the 10 uh, provinces uh, agreed to the plan. Um, and Quebec set up its own plan separately from the very start, designed to be harmonized. Um, but yeah, that was the mid 1960s. Now, at that point, uh, this is a term I'd only heard once I started working here, it was set up as a pay-go plan, there, which means uh, pay as you go. There was a little bit of, uh, of money set aside into provincial bonds to, to put the, a buffer fund in there. But by and large, the idea was most of the, the mostly structured where younger workers would pay, you know, and their employers would make uh, contributions and the beneficiary would flow to beneficiaries. Now, if you look at this chart in the 1960s, you'll see that there were about six and a half workers for every uh, one beneficiary. So it was a very uh, effective system when those demographics are there and favorable. Now things started to change over the subsequent decades. Um, basically birth rates went down um, and family sizes became smaller. And at the same time, um, people began living longer, very, very positive things. So this is all, all good in and of itself, but um, the challenge became came uh, around the de you know, different demographics of the pay-go system. Now, every three years, um, CPP is checked out independently by something called the Office of the Chief Actuary in Ottawa. It's, uh, it's part of the department, uh, the, the National uh, Financial Services Regulator, OSFI. Um, so uh, the, the Office of the Chief Actuary takes a look at all of the components that feed into the Canada Pension Plan. Demographics, you know, immigration, projected economic growth rates, um, and all of these elements to see if the plan is sustainable. And in the mid-1990s, they came back to um, the nine provinces in the plan and the federal government, um, specifically the finance ministers who are the stewards of the plan. And they said, there's a major problem here. Um, by the year 2015, the CPP fund is going to be depleted. And at that point, you're either going to have to significantly hike contributions or slash benefits. Over to you. Uh, and in, a, in sort of a very uh, positive case that, that sometimes unsung, um, those 10 uh, finance ministers, nine from the provinces uh, and the federal finance minister sat down to negotiate a solution, and which they achieved, which was uh, among them was the creation of us, CPP Investments, or the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, as it's also known. So we were created in 1997, and then the first dollar flowed through to us in 1999. But the logic behind what we did was um, that the funds would flow to us. Uh, we'll see in the next slide to, to support the plan. So again, uh, if you look at the model here, uh, contributors pay into the Canada, you know, and their employers pay into the CPP fund. It, those fund contributions then flow to us. Um, and we deploy them into global markets to get stronger returns than would have been there previously. Previously, what funds were there were invested in uh, provincial government bonds, which are very, very safe, um, generally very, very safe investment, but very low yielding as a result. There's a whole question of, you know, risk return. And when things are, are generally safer, you generally get a lower return from them um, because of that, uh, you, you know, get higher returns, there's a risk trade-off. Um, so it's deployed to us, we put it into markets and um, beginning uh, this decade and uh, increasingly as we go forward, 
more of the investment returns of the fund will be needed to support uh, payments to beneficiaries. So again, benefit payments flow back into the fund and ultimately land uh, in the pockets of uh, beneficiaries when they retire or when they begin claiming their CPP. Now, uh, the, the structure of the plan uh, has been talked about a lot, uh, both in Canada and globally. And a lot of that is about the success of the governance model, which we have. Now, we operate at arm's length from government. That means we're, we're ultimately accountable to the stewards. Um, but in there is, uh, in the part of the structure is that we have an independent professional board of directors. So just to give you a sense of things, we've uh, recently had uh, a new chair appointed who is the former CEO of Sun Life. Uh, also, another member recently joined uh, we, a new, the board who was a former CEO of Rogers Communications. So this board is designed to be very high level professional uh, business people who have great experience in sort of governing, you know, leading organizations. Um, so it's the board that selects our CEO, approves policies, oversees investment decisions, uh, ultimately made by our investment prof uh, professionals. So that means we operate at arm's length with government, uh, working to the mandate that's been laid out for us in legislation. At the same time, we're very accountable. Um, and you'll see that in terms of our reporting. Uh, we have extensive, we report quarterly. Many pension funds only report once a year. Um, and every second year, and we're hoping to see some of you uh, at our public meetings next year in 2024, we have public meetings in every province that is um, a member of the Canada Pension Plan. And that's part of the CPPIB Act that uh, oversees us. Now, um, one of the things that people have talked about, and I know here in Alberta, I've spoken to many people who really value this, is that because we operate at arm's length from government, that means it is financial professionals making the investment decisions and um, not politicians who, you know, politicians have set things up. They're the stewards, they oversee things, but they're not the ones signing off on or directing investment decisions. That sits with us. Um, now, some people have uh, talked valued that, but they said, you know, I'm, they're always concerned, oh, well, I, I don't want... You know, I, I would like professionals investing that funds. I don't want, you know, uh, they're concerned about the possibility of political interference. And um, we've explained that there's actually significant protections in the Canada Pension Plan. Uh, because it is um, the way it's set up, um, in order to change our legislations, what is required is that two-thirds of the pro participating provinces representing two-thirds of the population would have to change our act and our investment mandate in order to to make that happen. Um, so that's a very significant barrier. So I somewhat, somewhat joked that if the federal government ever decided, decided we want you to invest in all the pension money in bubblegum machines, uh, you know, and every member of the federal parliament was in agreement on that, uh, they could still not bring that to pass, even if they passed legislation without two thirds of the provinces representing two thirds of the population. So this as act as a, as a check to sort of ensure that uh, it, it's a level of protection around our uh, political independence. Now, uh, the most important thing uh, in terms of the sustainability of the fund is the returns that we've generated. Um, we recently reported earnings and uh, as you've seen, and I'm sure in your own portfolios, markets have been very bumpy. And we, uh, but we have a very diversified portfolio, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And it's there to help ensure, you know, that uh, manages that risk while delivering, you know, uh, maximizing returns without undue risk. Um, now, the important figure that we we very much focus on is the 10-year return. And over the last 10 years, we we managed to deliver a return of 9.6% annualized over, uh, on average, over 10 years. And that's helped to grow the fund to $576 billion. Now, in terms of our performance and how we do against uh, both our benchmarks and others, um, there's a, this is a report uh, from a report by an organization in New York, an independent consultancy called Global SWF. Uh, they went, uh, they fought track both um, sovereign wealth funds and independent pension plan fund managers like ourselves, and taking a look at a survey globally of all the international pen, uh, major independent pension fund managers. Um, they found that we delivered over uh, a 10 year window, the highest return of any single pension, independent major pension fund manager on the planet uh, with a return of 10.9%. Uh, so again, that's not just that 10.9% annualized uh, over the window that they did, which ran, I think our fiscal 2022. Um, that wasn't just the strongest performance of any pension fund manager in Canada or North America, organizations like California teachers and these sorts of things. This was again, the strongest performance of any pension fund manager on the planet. Um, you can see it in this chart here. Um, in fact, we also, our performance was so strong, it was stronger than any other 
sovereign wealth fund on the planet, except for uh, an organization called New Zealand Super over that time. So again, that's uh, performance, uh, maximizing returns, that undue risk uh, to meet the needs of the plan is what we're focused on. As you'll see, how we do we achieve this? Well, uh, in the time that we've been created, the more than 20 years, uh, we built up a global presence because we invest globally. Our headquarters is in Toronto, not Ottawa, as some people think, uh, but we have offices in major financial centers around the world. And we think those offices, uh, the reason that we built them out and, and deployed them is because we found that uh, it's our belief that having uh, effectively these offices on the ground, both to look for opportunities, transactions, uh, but also to sort of oversee existing assets that we have are good value in terms of uh, what they create for the fund. And uh, just to talk a little bit, um, part of the, the reason we were set up to be an active manager starting in uh, 2006, um, and at that point, um, you know, some funds manage passively, just, you know, buy some index, you know, track the stock indices and then some bonds. Um, uh, at the time, our board thought that there'd be opportunities for us to deliver enhanced value um, and partly because of our structural advantages and developed advantages. Now, structural advantages here are things that have just, just come to us naturally. Um, you know, we have a long investment horizon, we have scale and we have the certainty of assets that allow us to take a very uh, deploying to assets with a very long term time frame. Uh, at the same time, developed advantages are things like, you know, building up internal expertise, expert partnerships and relationships, things we have to continually work at. And taking a look, you can see uh, the portfolio. It's diversified both in terms of uh, geography and assets. Our big, single biggest market is the United States, um, although we have major deployment into other, other major markets. And also, um, I mentioned that some you know, pension funds traditionally will just have you no know, public equities and, and fixed income. Ours is a more diversified portfolio. Uh, it includes a, things, a significant amount of private equity, which means companies that aren't listed on stock exchanges, but are part of the, the investable universe uh, if you're able to go into them and seek returns there. Um, also things like infrastructure, uh, for example, we're the, the owner of one of the largest, uh, I believe the uh, owner of the largest operator of ports in the United States, as well as the UK. Um, and these again are asset, infrastructure assets that we own directly and therefore have the opportunity to collect the uh, cash flows and returns that are generated by them over time. Uh, and also things like real estate, for example. And we also have a separately a credit arm that uh, does private credit um, work directly. To, so our fixed income isn't just government bonds, but it's a more diversified portfolio. Uh, we have significant holdings right here in Alberta, just a few of them to mention. And uh, um, their CEOs of these organizations were actually participating in our event yesterday. Um, companies in which we own almost 100% include Wolf Midstream right here uh, in Calgary and Tyne Energy as well. And these are, are both companies in which we've uh, been invested for a great number of years and sort of have as direct holdings. Um, so I'll come uh, back to this, but the, the key thing uh, and the, the very good news of going back to that, if you think back to that history graph, in 1995, they had the Office of the Chief Actuary checking things out saying, you know, is the CPP sustainable or not? Uh, now, since we were created and began generating returns, the good news is um, the Office of the Chief Actuary every three years has repeatedly checked out the health of the CPP. And they said um, due to uh, the factors, including uh, the growth, the investment returns that we've been enabled to generate, they project that the Canada Pension Plan will be sustainable for the next 75 years. So um, I'd say if there's one message that we really like you to get out, um, you know, again, a lot of people have conceptions that CPP is not going to be there for them. Uh, is not on a sustainable track. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, one of them that we think is, you know, there were headlines in the 1990s that some of us who were in the 1990s remember uh, talking about why, how CPP wouldn't be there. But again, solutions were put in place to make the fund sustainable. Um, again, uh, don't take our word, but look at what the Office of the Chief Actuary says in its independent review, sustainable for at least the, at least the next 75 years. Um, we also hear a lot about, uh, for example, US Social Security, where they're projected to run into issues uh, in about a decade. Uh, fortunately, we took steps to alleviate that, whereas there's still issues there. And a lot of people still hear about things like Nortel's pension plan, Sears Canada, and that leaves, uh, you know, that negative news stays there. But uh, I think you can, you know, if there's people in your life, young people especially, who think CPP won't be there for them. That's, um, that's something that you can explain uh, how, how these changes help to add that support. Now, uh, jumping ahead to the topic of the day, 
um, an Alberta pension plan. Uh, you've heard a lot about that this proposal, uh, likely seen it in the news. So we're going to take you through a little bit of a timeline. Now, the APP discussion uh, goes back actually a, a quite a few years. Um, some people I've heard it suggested the idea might have bubbled up in the in the 1980s. Um, but where it gained significant sort of um, attention was about 20 years ago when something uh, known as the firewall letter um, written by um, a, a group of Albertans, which included a younger, a young Stephen Harper. Um, and there was a time where there was tension between the federal government and provincial government. Um, and so and some ideas were put forward how uh, Alberta could be more autonomous. And one was the idea that what if Alberta pulled out of the Canada pension plan uh, as is its right under the constitution and uh, set up its own plan. Um, interestingly, Ralph Klein, uh, the premier of the day, took a look at that and said it was not something that he wanted to pursue. He didn't didn't see the sense of it. So the idea uh, lay very fallow for a number of years. Uh, the author of one of those authors of the uh, letters became the, the Canadian prime minister for nearly a decade. Um, so very quiet up until about 2019. Um, and again, when uh, Premier Kenny was elected, uh, and I don't think I need to tell very many people there continue to be tensions between uh, provincially and federally, um, this idea was sort of raised, uh, brought out again. There was uh, something called the Fair Deal Panel uh, established, which toured Alberta for consultations. Uh, we made a contribution, we appeared at it and, and uh, made contribution to that, uh, that panel. And they produced a report which suggested further study. Um, a report was commissioned by, uh, with, by Morneau Chappelle, now known as LifeWorks, uh, or which then became LifeWorks, uh, to study the APP. Um, but that report was not released up until uh, earlier this year in September. Um, and that point, uh, subsequent to that, uh, and I'll go through some of the things that were brought up, but the Alberta government has subsequently launched a fresh round of consultations around, uh, around this idea. Now, there's a number of, of considerations uh, around an APP. Um, some of our senior executives have spoken out about that. Uh, and I encourage you, and we can circulate some, and also not just our, our senior executives, but a number of third-party pension experts, uh, academics experts on this. Um, Professor Trevor Toome, uh, right here in Alberta, has, has written some very insightful things about it, um, which I'll go through today. But afterwards, we can likely circulate some, uh, some of the material, um, the, some of the commentary that's been put out there. But there are a number of, of considerations around this, uh, asset transfer uncertainty, contribution rates, portability, political independence, uh, the popularity of this idea itself, and costs of implementation. So starting out, um, again, the uh, asset transfer, the report came out and the one that grabbed the headlines, uh, which suggested that of the uh, existing CPP fund, Alberta, which has historically uh, contributed 16%, um, made 16% of contributions, would in fact be entitled to 53% of the assets. Uh, now we've, uh, we, our senior executives have taken issue with that number. Many pension experts have weighed in on it. Uh, a big issue there is that uh, there's, there's language which in, in the um, CPPIB, CPPIB Act, which points to a formula for exiting. Unfortunately, that formula has, uh, you know, um, Professor Toome here in Alberta has described it as a vague mess. Um, I leave it to the pension experts to discuss this, but um, but it was very unclear and vague. And in fact, in the LifeWorks plan, um, what the LifeWorks author said is, you know, if we use this formula, literally, uh, Alberta would be entitled to 118% of the fund, um, you know, which was completely uh, impossible. So they had to go with it, create their own formula, invent something to do that, which is being, you know, contested by others. And again, this is a situation where if Alberta or BC tried to do the same thing, again, they get multiples uh, of what is actually in the fund. So there's, there's definite challenges around that, and that's a very contested issue. Um, also, something to talk about, you know, uh, it's around contribution rates will be set off. You know, if, if Alberta were to leave, it would have to, you know, what contribution rates would first of all be dictated by what kind of uh, assets they would be able to claim from the fund or not. Uh, so that's a significant thing. Also a very uh, significant consideration, part of the reason and the proponents of the plan have talked about the fact, and this is a fact that um, Albertans have a younger population and a wealthier population on average than the rest of the country. So they have made higher contributions. Now, one thing to con contemplate there though, is that the fact that, um, you know, the plan is still fair for everyone it, it, at the individual level, you know, whether I'm working in Alberta or Ontario, if I'm paying identical amounts of what I'm paying in, I will get that amount out. So while Alberta has this younger population, 
um, that is paying in, uh, they correspondingly are going to get benefits as a result of that. Um, all the correspond just as they would if they were working in Saskatchewan or Ontario or British Columbia. Um, also bearing in mind there were issues within the report around uh, you know, portability. Just to give an example, I'm, I'm from Saskatchewan, rural Saskatchewan. Um, three younger siblings, uh, two of them actually when they were in their 20s, I think it was in their 20s, came to Alberta to work. One is a nurse, one is a teacher. Uh, again, you know, Alberta, very dynamic economy, lots of people coming in, but they paid in um, for years when they were younger. Now, subsequently, uh, my family getting old, parents getting older, so they decided to move back to Saskatchewan. Um, but there were issues around accounting for that sort of thing within, um, you know, a, a, a figuring out an Alberta pension plan, uh, whereas under the Canada pension plan, it's seamless. Wherever you work within, within uh the provinces that participate in CPP, that is covered and your benefits are, are sort of correspond there. Um, but going to this slide, uh, another consideration is that while Alberta has a younger population now, there are projections that, you know, Alberta's population will continue to age. And why does that matter? Uh, one example we want to talk about is that when Quebec decided to set up its own plan, in, you know, in parallel with, uh, with CPP, uh, with harmonized benefits, at that time, they part of the you know logic would have been that um, you know Quebec thought, well, we actually they had a much younger demographics at that point. So at that point in the 1960s, it was like, well, we're a province with large tends to have larger families, so we've got more supportive demographics. So we wouldn't want to you know lose that by by going into a larger plan. But what happened was that things actually shifted. So Quebec now has an older population on average than the rest of the, of the provinces. What does that mean? It means that while the QPP still pays the same benefits, sort of equivalent to what CPP pays, they actually, uh, employees and employers in Quebec actually have to make higher contributions just to maintain the same benefits. So it goes to illustrate while demographics can be favorable at one point, um, they can then become unfavorable. And it really depends on, you know, how demographic and, and, and these long-term trends go. But what is known is that by going into a larger plan, um, you, you sort of harmonize those risks. Uh, um, and also speaking to portability, again, uh, you know, to maintain the portability, they must uh, create something that mirrors the CPP. Um, but, you know, again, you know, if you, there's all, all sorts of questions and uncertainty related to you know, going forward and how that would sort of interplay. And we've heard a lot from uh, particularly Alberta businesses and business leaders have spoken out uh, to talk about the issue of portability, because again, Alberta is an economy, it's a very dynamic, uh, two of my siblings came to work here. Um, and uh, so much of the Alberta economy has drawn on labor Canadians from, from elsewhere in the country. And again, that's been a very win-win situation. Um, so there's concern among some business leaders that about anything that might cause issues around, around that portability. And also you can, once you have those benefits, you can retire. Um, again, you may have seen our CEO speaking yesterday about this, uh, that, that benefit of whether you want to retire in Alberta, retire in Saskatchewan, retire uh, someplace warmer, as he put it, um, that, is, that is, you're free to do that. Now, going back to, again, that question of political interference, uh, as mentioned, I just want to repeat this because I think it's significant. If say the federal government decided that they wanted to change the mandate, try and change the mandate of the Canada Pension Plan. They can't do it without two thirds of the, the provinces representing two thirds of the population. On the other hand, if you had an Alberta pension plan, it would be beholden to the government of the day. So the government of the day could, you know, while the Munma government may say, oh, we were, we're gonna leave the existing mandate in place, you know, another a subsequent leader or subsequent, you know, government could go in and change because you'd have only one steward there versus, you know, the 10 that are currently have for the Canada Pension Plan. Um, and we've seen, and, and you may have seen some of the polls, um, the, Alberta, the Alberta Pension Plan has not been a popular idea. And uh, most recent polling we've all seen, it continues to suggest that. Um, a lot of people, you know, and we have articulated, a lot of Alberts have articulated that here's a system that has worked, has worked well for them. Um, and they, they're, you know, the benefits have been enjoyed so uh, to make the leap into something unknown is, is of significant concern. And another issue that's been brought up, and this is from the LifeWorks report, um, you'd have to add up both sets of numbers here because, again, to, um, to set up your own plan, a big concern is duplication. Uh, because right now in Ontario, when, uh, when Ontario talked about setting up its own pension plan to supplement the CPP, 
um, they were looking at it and they very quickly discovered uh, one of the benefits of the CDP is all that administration that's done via the Canada Revenue Agency. You know, if you're an employer, um, you've got to remit, you know, CDP um, and DI and taxes uh, upwards, um, which exists at the federal level, but at, it doesn't exist generally at a provincial level. So the report suggested that between startup costs and implementation costs, it could cost Albertan taxpayers up to $2.2 billion. That's just to get everything up and running. And that's the existing projection right now. So that's a, a consideration, a potential hurdle uh, that, that many Albertans have taken a look at and said, and, and again, I think it's frustrating, including for many who, in the business community who question, will there be more administration for us? And why are we doing something where we're creating two sets of you know, bureaucrats effectively doing the thing that one set of bureaucrats is doing now at, you know, and why would we double up those costs and increase those costs? And again, going back to the risk pooling, um, you know, it's the whole question of strength in numbers. Uh, you know, insurance, uh, the insurance industry has known this for literally centuries that, you know, if you pool a group of 10 people together for life insurance, you could, you know, the risks are far greater than if you pool, you know, a thousand, uh, 10,000, a million. Uh, one of the benefits of the plan is, again, um, no matter, you know, in terms of the dynamics, demographics, this sort of thing, the risk is pooled across a much larger area. So even if you have, for example, one part of the country, one province experiencing any sort of economic hardship, uh, change in demographics, that sort of thing, it all sort of, you get that additional risk benefit of pooling together. Now the process um, is very complex uh, for, uh, you know, sort of withdrawal. Um, so the question is, and the government has not, as I said, they're studying the issue has not made a, a decision yet on whether to proceed with a referendum, but uh, there's sort of, this is some of the, the timeline that would be in place to sort of bring things forward. But there, there would be, again, the significant complexity of trying to figure out all of these questions and, and a lot of time and energy sort of focused on that, again, for a system that is up and is, is working for uh, Canadians. So again, um, that's, um, I'm glad to bring it back to, and, and looking forward, we'll move to questions here. But again, CPP investments is widely seen globally as a Canadian success story. More than 21 million, the strong performance we've seen. Importantly, the Office of the Chief Actuary saying it's sustainable for at least the next 75 years. Uh, working at arm's length, that, that investor protection, I'm focused on our singular mandate. And um, being able to build out uh, over 20 years of uh, global diversification and asset mix. Um, so uh, again, very happy to switch over and take questions from participants. All right, so we have a few uh, questions in the Q&A Q uh, side, if you want to take a quick peek at those. Uh, the first one was uh, asked, what about territories, Nunavut, Northwest, and uh, Yukon? I think that was in uh, regards to number of provinces and, and uh, yes. population. Yes, so in addition to the, um, the, the provinces, the three territories are part of the Canada Pension Plan. Uh, in terms of board and governance, they'd be represented there in, by the federal government, but they've also been involved in, in some of the committee work. But yes, if you move up to work in the territories, if you contribute in the territories, if you want to retire in the territories, um, it is, it's um, all harmonized. Um, so nine provinces plus three territories. Okay. And then a couple questions when you hit the Quebec uh, side of the equation, who manages uh, QPP? The Caisse de Depot, um, which is based out of Montreal. So they have uh, CDPQ, as uh, they're known by their, their initial. They are the pension fund manager for the QPP. And I believe there's some other, um, they also integrate some other, so I think maybe government and insurance funds in there as well. So it, it's a combination of things, I believe. Uh, but they are the manager of the QPP. Okay. And uh, has Quebec ever talked about coming into CPP and dropping the QPP? And if not, uh, why haven't they not acted on it, do you think? Uh, there has been no discussion around that. And I think part of that might be complexity. Um, uh, again, the situation is QPP was set up at exactly the same time as um, CPP. So there's there's sort of a running in parallel agreements between the two, that sort of thing. So there's been uh, no discussion that I know of over that time about uh, about integrating the two. Right. And I believe they have a slightly different investment philosophy as well. Like they're Absolutely correct. Support Quebec um, industry. Uh, exactly. So Quebec has what's known as a dual mandate. 
which uh, you have to look up the exact wording, but effectively, in addition to generating returns for the for the uh, beneficiaries, uh, they also have a mandate in their legislation or ruling ever structured that to sort of invest in Quebec to support uh, the economic development in Quebec. So that tends to be why you're seeing uh, the fund to sort of deploy capital into uh, specific projects in the province and that sort of thing. Now that adds uh, to, you know, again, each each province or each pension fund manager operates with the mandate they've given. That does give it an added level of complexity versus uh, our mandate, which is just the part one of it, very singular. You know, maximize returns without undue risk, taking into account the needs of the plan. So effectively that allows us to really focus on just doing those things and looking to generate those returns. And again, we feel, you know, in terms of uh, that very singular clear mandate, um, we think that's very much tied into how we've been able to deliver those very strong returns that I referred to earlier in the presentation. All right. And speaking of the returns, the uh, question, have we ever, has the CPP uh, investment board ever considered divesting itself from fossil fuels, from all fossil fuels? Okay, excellent question. Um, what I would do is I, I strongly encourage you, I believe the speech of our CEO, John Graham, that he made yesterday in Calgary, has been posted to our website, uh, CPP Investments. Um, so we're, um, and, and we can send that to you as well. Uh, maybe with, we'll circulate to, to, to people who are interested uh, afterwards in an email directing to the website. But, but John was very clear. Uh, we don't believe in divestment. And we've uh, been saying that for a number of years. We think it's very counterproductive. Uh, we think that a lot of today's you know, conventional energy companies, and we're already seeing some of this are starting to get involved in, you know, again, that the decarbonization journey, figuring things out. Some of them are setting up their own plans for, you know, renewable investments, uh, sending that up. Others are looking at means in which the, the products that they produce, uh, that they can produce with using, you know, fewer emissions, using technology like carbon capture, that sort of thing. But uh, one of the things we've talked about is that, you know, the energy industry in that centered here in, in Canada, in Alberta, you know, there's tremendous project management uh, tremendous engineering, tremendous, you know, financial uh, management there. And just to give you a little example, um, we have a partnership, uh, you know, we look around the world at investments and opportunities. Um, and we made in the last few years investments in addition to our conventional energy, oil and gas and such. Um, we've also made significant investments into renewable. One such project was, um, you know, some of our projects are actually off offshore in both uh, in Europe, uh, both France and Germany. Um, and we, and when we were developing those, we were looking for a partner because again, we're a capital provider, we're an investor, we're not the operator, the arms and on, on the ground type of thing. And so when we looked around the world, we have the opportunity to connect with a lot of partners and the partner we found was Enbridge headquartered right here, probably within about, uh, 500 to, 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 uh, you know, meters from me. Um, and why did we partner with Enbridge on that? Because again, uh, Enbridge, which operates pipelines and, and a significant amount is really an energy infrastructure company and they know how to run major projects. So again, we partnered with them on that and uh, have developed significant, um, you know, offshore wind capability in Europe. So if those, uh, you know, and, and those have launched, they're successful, they're generating energy and selling that into the European market where in the last few years, energy prices have risen for the, the unfortunate geopolitical reasons we know. Um, and more recently, um, once one of our projects was sort of built out, uh, and operating, we uh, Enbridge actually we sold a portion a uh, portion of it to Enbridge. Um, so you know, at four net proceeds for ourselves. So we provided that initial capital. We got it up and running together. Enbridge said we'd be interested in owning the whole asset. So we sold them that asset at a at a profit to ourselves. So it's that win win piece. But again, if you talk about divestment of a company that has connections to the fo the fossil fuel industry we would not partner with, you know, we would never have partnered with Enbridge, but we see how, you know, uh, you know, the industry just has that level of expertise and oil and gas is going to be part of the global energy mix for some time. Um, so we're very, um, we continue to, um, to, you know, we expect to be invested in there. Um, one other thing I'll just talk about, and again, talking about that Alberta expertise is another asset that we have here. I mentioned a company Wolf Midstream based in Calgary. Um, in addition to, they operate pipelines midstream assets here. But they also created something called the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, which is, I think, possibly remains the largest carbon capture project in Canada. 
It's uh, hooked up to region. It's, it's sort of outside of Edmonton. It's hooked up to refinery there and other facilities, and it carries away that uh, it's a piece of infrastructure that carries away carbon emissions. So uh, reducing the emissions for for the clients. So again, we're seeing advancements in that area. We want to stay engaged, and we particularly want to be supportive as the energy energy industry evolves uh, evolves as it goes along. Thank you. All right. A uh, question from Glenn, 64-year-old applying for a disability CPP. Uh, what what could the Alberta what could the Alberta take over of the plan, or, or how what what effect would if the Alberta were to take over that the plan would that have on on his uh, application for a disability? Um, again, well, I, I'm just going to hold off on answering too many administration questions. Yeah, I, I think I, that a, one's, uh, we're getting a little bit specific on one-on-one. On, on one. It's a little challenging there. I, yeah, I'll just clarify again, because CPP investments, we're the, we're the investment manager. Uh, administration is actually done by Service Canada, um, okay. Ottawa, so any administration questions. But speaking to this one, um, what's been said, you know, is that you'd have to work to make uh, the plans comparable um so i you know that would suggest that you know the, the existing structure is there uh but we're also talking about a speculative situation so uh i can i can you know speak only so much to a very very speculative situation uh, I'm, I'm afraid yeah so for sure so i've got two questions that sort of uh, back to back with each other uh what ethical considerations are applied to investments in cpp and are there now or are there plans to change in the future areas of the global or Canadian economies in which will be off limits for CPP investments for ideological reasons? And again, okay. that's uh, oil and gas renewable. But I think speaking a little bit here to the ESG, the environmental, social and, and governance issues, perhaps. Fantastic. OK, great set of questions and a great one to, to pair it together. So first of all, in terms of ES, um, you know, considerations, and we, we drill down specifically on those like Things like, uh, you know, they can be, you know, uh, environmental like emissions or, um, or, or, you know, under the, the social human rights, that sort of thing. Uh, what we do with those factors and governance as well, very important to us, is we have an integrated approach, which is we, you know, um, we're not investing on the basis of ideological reasons. We're investing in, in terms of our mandate, maximize returns without undue risk, taking into account the needs of the plan. However, looking at those factors, some people would say, oh, well, those are non-financial factors. But um, we have a different view, which is that, uh, backed up by our experiences, that we look at these factors and say, what's the materiality, especially for a long-term investor? Now, this gave you an example on human rights. So we engage with a lot of company where sometimes we've seen situations where there's concerns about human rights, human rights in the supply chains. Um, and we've done that for, for years, um, everything from being part of groups, collaborative engagements around, you know, the sourcing of, of uh, metals used in electronics and which jurisdictions those come from to sort of force, also force labors in certain jurisdictions. Now people would say, okay, well, this is an ideological sort of thing. And would, actually what we'd say is, well, you might think that or it's ethical, but for us, uh, let's just put it out there. If you're a company, uh, let's say you're just a customer, and you like to buy, you know, product from a certain store. You might think, oh, well, that's great. I, I like buying this product. Uh, what happens if you find out that uh, that product is made using forced labor, and that comes to light and it becomes public? Are you going to continue to buy that product? Are you going to continue to want to to spend your money there? Um, and you just take consumers alone. Suddenly, you've got a situation where a human rights violation and supply chain has a huge financial impact. Um, so that's a consideration. Also, when these things happen, uh, governments, regulators take a look and say, wait a second, we don't want to import products that have forced labor in the supply chain. So in terms of looking at it, people would say it's an ethical consideration. And it is, and it, you know, and then people, but for us, we're using our long-term investor lens to look at these things and say, these are material financial considerations. And that goes for, for that, for governance, for, so we're always investing in line with that basis. So we integrate these factors into our investment calculations that we make, and we engage with companies when we have concerns about it to change that, because again, these can be very long-term uh, potential financial risks. Um, so we put that out there. Now, going back to, again, that ideological concerns, um, our legislation is very clear about how we we do that. So the only areas which we're, we have a screen, which we'd be excluded from uh, investing in are landmines and cluster munitions. 
And that's due to some very specific Canadian legislation that, that pertaining to those two, two things. Otherwise, we, we are open in where we can invest, but we're an active manager and we're always looking at those factors that are a consideration. And again, in terms of oil and gas, um, we, we can circulate that link to John's speech, but he can make, you know, I've spoken to some of it, and, and but uh, making very clear that again, we see, you know, oil and gas is going to be needed for a long term period of time. Um, so we're invested there. And we're investing also in in new solution, you know, uh, new solutions, new opportunities to sort of address that lower emission future. And that ranges from everything from uh, renewable energy on one part to car, you know, things like the Alberta carbon trunk line. Right. Uh, a couple of questions, uh, a little more theoretical, but um, I think this would require a little bit of a guess on your part. But if Alberta were to go to with an APP, uh, individuals in the province already collecting Canada Pension or people that have earned all of their CPP dollar or contributions in province, but now residing outside the province. What kind of challenges do you think might happen? So this assumes <laughs> a whole bunch of factors, but yes. uh, if they're, uh, how would you see that? I mean, uh, to my mind, if they're not living in the Alberta at the time that it eventually happens, I don't think that would have an impact. But um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how how do you see that? Well, um, again, there's there's uh, I, I'm going to hold refrain on speaking too much to all of that. Um, again, you've got that certainty now that comes from where would you pay in, where we retire, that sort of thing. Um, the question of of benefits. Um, you know, uh, you know, again, what is, the, you know, what are the, the terms and conditions that everything that would have to be worked out by governments as, as right. you do all of this? I mean, that's a very, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, it's be asking me to speculate on, on something where there's a, a lot of uncertainty. So these are, these are, these are great questions. These are the right questions to be yeah. asking. Um, and these are a lot of questions on which there, you know, a lot of people are seeking clarity, uh, but it's difficult because there's so many unknowns at this juncture. Okay, uh, let's we'll pull back to a much wider uh, ranging question here for you. Um, there is a huge startup, like 75 to, to $1 billion, 75 billion mm -hmm, to $1 mm -hmm. billion, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. 75 to 1.2 to, to do the implementation. Why is there such a huge range in there? And do you have any, could you comment perhaps as well on where that, how they came up with 53%? Um, on the first part, I would simply say uh, it's in the report as we see uh, there's a tremendous amount of we don't know, uh, you know, trying to work out what. Uh, so uh, I, I would I would point people back to the report to try and understand what the rationale is, uh, a range from that low up to 2.2 billion. But we do know that uh, we've spoken to a lot of people who talk about those very significant costs. I mean, you're thinking about developing a relationship, IT to like with every employer and every but every employer in the province and trying to figure out how to make that work. Uh, you know, that there's, there's high potential costs there. That 53%, again, you have, if you look right in the report, it, it, they did say, well, if we use the literal language of, of this, this is the, you know, would get more than what's in the fund, you know, alone, so, you know, in Ontario, you'd have, we could look at Ontario and British Columbia, same sort of idea. Um, so they said, because that doesn't make sense, uh, we'll have to invent, we're, you know, we've talked about inventing the formula that they used to do that. And that formula that was was invented, again, a lot of a lot of very smart people, well, a lot of uh, good pension experts here in Alberta have taken a look, Professor Toome has taken issue with it. Um, so yeah, they, but again, the literal language within the act had to, you know, got this, you know, uh, 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 and it says so right in the report that the, you know, you can't take more than what's there, you know, type of thing. So they, they set up a separate, uh, they had to create their own formula. Okay. Now, I know you have sent some correspondence to Mr. Dinning regarding uh, the an opportunity to speak at one of his uh, town halls or, or whatever. One of the questions mm -hmm. here has, uh, have, have, has this information that you've presented with us some version of it been shared with the Alberta government or how did they respond to the, I believe you, it was a, a letter that you sent them or some kind of communication uh, regarding that? Yeah, um, that is, that is in the public realm. You can see that letter. Um, I, I just say that letter uh, regarding some concerns around the consultation that we put out there. 
uh, you can find it online. And I think uh, the way it, it's sort of written out by uh, by our, our Michelle Leduc, our head of public affairs and communication, sort of spells out some of the the concerns we we had there uh, in, in great detail. And I I think it would be safer for me to refer folks to take a look at that letter. It's available online. Okay. Um... I'm not sure if this one is in your area, but how has the QPP performed over the last 10 years in comparison to, to the CPP plan? I don't have the exact number, but I would say if you if you that slide we referenced where um, global SWF, um, uh, the CP, you know, KES would have been CDPQ would have been in that as well. And the answer is over that 10 period period that they studied, we were we were stronger. Um, I'll just put it at that. And we were stronger than, uh, we had higher uh, returns than every uh, every major Canadian, every major US pension, and every major European global. Yeah. Right. And I think I know the answer to this one, but do uh, people all across Canada have the, pay the same CPP contribution rates? Correct. Yeah. It's harmonized contribution rates. Uh, but in Quebec, they, while well, you get the same benefits, they're higher because their demographics, which used to be younger, became older, so they had to increase uh, contribution rates to get the same benefits. Okay. Um, my goodness. So, um, th th this is another, you're not going to have an answer for it, but, uh, well, actually, we have heard some things in the press. Who will decide the number that Alberta would get? Uh, that's going to be left up. I believe to the federal uh, like they, they've given the it fed, the federal department of finance. There's uh, uh, their, their role is to sort of work on and, and, you know, so oversee that number as well. Um, so you've got us that uh, you may have seen that uh, there was a recent uh, pension fund conference around that and that uh, the federal go government is looking now to the office of the chief actuary to get their own number. Um, so these are conversations that are ongoing between the, the two governments. Right. Um, okay. I, I don't want people to think I'm ignoring some of the questions, but, uh, so, some of them are, are, it, it's you, just all theory, I guess. Um, okay. <laughs> why, why isn't the doubt, why can't we force the Alberta government to, uh, tell us the facts. Uh, it's, it, it's more of a no. Can't go there. Sorry. It's there's there's a lot of questions that we don't have answers for because we're on step one of probably two or three hundred before we can even uh, look at some of the questions answers to these yeah. responses. Like you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, can I choose to take it or not take it? Can I stay with a CPP and not go APP? Those are all pieces that are actually as you said previously excellent questions, but we just don't have nearly enough information or, or, or details from the yeah I think I think one thing though would be that if an APP were created that means that if you're in Alberta you would be have to you know be compelled to go into the APP um to to put it out there again and and, and this is a bigger sort of picture element addressing a lot of those questions you know Albertans are within their rights to uh decide whether they want to remain you know Pensions are response, constitutional responsibility to the provinces, not the federal government. So Albertans have those those rights, and Albertan, the Albertan people have, have the rights on, uh, you know, on this. Um, so the Alberta government has said, well, you know, if we're going to do this, we'll hold a referendum. Um, whether they choose to proceed to do that, um, you know, it, that's that's a decision that they will will be making. And it also, but ultimately means, and this is one reason why we're working a lot with groups right here in Alberta. I mean, Albertans will decide. You know, Albertans, like everyone on this call, it is um, it sits within, you know, the, the the people of Alberta to ultimately to make the call on this. And uh, the government will, of course, uh, has said it will decide whether or not to proceed with a referendum. So, um, you know, it won't be that won't be decided, you know, in other places in Canada, this sits within Alberta. So again, we've um, we we we've been speaking to a lot of groups in Alberta who have a lot of questions about this and want to know who we are. Um, and that's one of the reasons John was here uh this week and we wanted to you know uh, we uh i'll put it out there and we we've done some of our own polling you know, if you stop 100 canadians in the street and you said do you know what the canada pension plan is the majority of them would say yes yes we, uh yeah i know the canada pension plan. i'm receiving the canada pension plan etc but if you said to them unprompted do you know who manages the money behind the canada pension plan um 
it's a very low proportion of those same people who could tell you, oh, it's Canada Pension Plan Investment Board or CPP Investments as they're known. Um, so we're out here, we're talking about what we do, the value that we offer. Uh, we want Canadians to know who we are and Albertans to know, um, especially in these times, who we, who we are, what we do, how we're structured, how we operate, the returns that we've delivered and, and our focus on the future. And great questions like, well, you're, are you divesting from oil and gas? That sort of thing. These are, these are very valid questions. And we, so again, John, um, I, I think it'd be great if we can circulate that speech so you, people can hear a little bit more about who we are so that uh, should, should this come to a referendum and Albertans are making a decision on this, we want them to be aware of the facts uh, about us and the CPP. Perfect. Okay. Um, now there's one question: uh, How could we increase uh, the CPP significantly? That's actually in process right now, is it not? The the Correct. extended element yeah. of uh, Canada Pension moving it from 25 percent to 35 percent, I think, over the uh, next number of years. Correct. Um, it was several years ago um, now that the federal government and uh, the provinces were in alignment on what should be to be done with the uh, CPP. Um, and the decision was made. Um, so when the CPP is originally designed, something important to remember is it's not designed to cover all of your return, you know, your, yeah. your retirement income. It was always meant to be kind of a foundation, a part of it. So uh, when you get to retirement, you'll, you'd have worked, you'd have paid in, your employer would have paid in matching amounts. And the, the amount that you would get, if you, you know, everybody is different based on how much they worked and contributed over time, but it uses that same formula. But let's say you work for 40 full years um, at paying into the maximum amount, uh, you would receive 25% of the average industrial wage. So that worked out to um, about, it's, it's now about $13,000 or $14,000, I think. Um, but the way the, the decision was made with the provinces that we're going to actually increase contributions, but we're going to increase uh, benefits later on. So interestingly, a, a person who collects CPP today um, CPP is paying a small, playing a smaller part in their retirement than it will for their kids or grandkids. Because again, with those contributions going up, which part of which we'll be managing, uh, the benefits later on are going to increase to about a third of the average industrial wage. So effectively, they'll go from about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars to more than twenty thousand dollars. And these these amounts I quote are in uh, they're just they're in today's dollars. Um, so as inflation happens. You know those amount corresponding amounts will increase, um, but effectively, if you you know snapshot projected forward, the plan CPP has been expanded to at maximum payout from about thirteen, fourteen, or twenty five percent to more like point plus twenty thousand um, dollars, you know, or or a third. And since you brought up the inflation piece, the next question ties wonderfully into that. Uh, I know the CPP is is uh, has a cost of living adjustment of one hundred percent. The question here is. Um, how does CPP make that work? Like, how can you uh, offer the 100% cost of living adjustments on an annual basis? So, uh, again, this was set up uh, in the design of the plan um, where they said, you know, again, CPP is designed in this, this great, great system because for, for most of us who don't have, let's say, a defined benefit plan that goes to life, you know, you accrue financial assets and then you have to figure out, well, wait, am I going to live to be 70 Five, or I'm going to live to be 95 or 100, 105. Um, whereas with CPP, because it's all risk pooled, um, you know, if you if you do that large group of, uh, of people, you can make better sort of assertions. And um, yeah, so the decision was made that yeah, in, in CPP would be adjusted for inflation. Um, and you know, that's whether you know, as this inflation has been for a number of decades quite low, around two percent um, and very low, but we've seen that recently spike up. That has been so unwelcome, and which is why central banks are raising rates to deal with that. Um, but the idea is the, the design of the plan is there to um, to accommodate that. Now, in terms of our own investment portfolio, again, for us, we have a, a level of diversification. For example, real assets, um, it, you know, have traditionally fared well in 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 a, in a more inflationary environment. So again, instead of just having you know stocks and bonds, bonds being you know inflation is the nemesis of the bond market. Uh, instead of just having those things, we have a more diversified portfolio to, you know, again, if prices go up, well, you know, that means more um, certain things that we invest in can sort of adjust for your know, real estate tends to do well uh, in an inflationary, can do well in a in more inflationary environment or things like infrastructure where there's potential for costs or adjustments. Certain companies are able to 
uh, have flexibility to raise their pricing, that sort of thing. So by having part of the portfolio in more inflation resilient things, um, that that is how we sort of look at, you know, maximizing returns without undue risk, taking into account the needs of the plan, which include, you know, that inflation adjustment. Right. Uh, are there any provinces that have a provincial pension plan to supplement CPP? Good question. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. So, um, Again, the example I recited earlier was um, the Ontario, under previous government, Ontario felt that, again, that very issue was that they felt like Canada, you know, people in Canada needed greater retirement security because fewer people had defined benefit pensions. Uh, so they, with their suggestion, they actually favored expansion of the CPP, which ultimately happened. But at the time, the federal government said, we don't want to do that. So they said, okay, we'll create our own plan to supplement that. Uh, but they, when they did that, they realized, oh my gosh, there are massive administrative costs just to operate this plan. Um, so that would be an issue. Um, and ultimately, when the, there were change in sort of uh, political alignment, that's where they're like, the federal government said, yeah, we will move ahead with this. Ontario supported it, so which is what they wanted in the first place. Uh, right. Otherwise, I don't know that other any, any of the provinces that provide that, but I wouldn't, uh, you can't, yeah, you'd have to double check, uh, yeah. double check. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't aware of any myself. And I know Ontario had looked at it, as you said, and they went, this ain't going to work. And that that's pro that's one of the reasons they came on board with increasing the uh, the CPP base rate from 25 slowly over time to that 35% rate that you've already talked about. Correct. Um, and uh, current inflation, the only increase seniors going to see is, is the cost of the being adjustment that we see every January. So Correct. Unfortunately, we can't go much beyond that, I guess. Yep. Um, uh, do you have any, there's one question, where would people, how can they communicate with the provincial government to indicate their the displeasure or their support, I suppose, of the APP? I mean, I would suggest, obviously, writing to your MLAs and uh, um, Premier, perhaps, but other than that, there's really not... Um, do you have any other ideas? I mean, they, they, I, I, I defer to to Arta on where uh, is as an organization right. where where you guys would think. I'm uh, again just here. We're here to to sort of share information about who we are and what we do. But I do. I would note exactly. again. Yeah. Albertans will decide, and uh, yeah. So. Um. Oh, I don't think you can answer this one either. So I'm going to. I don't think you're not familiar with Aimco at all, right? The the provincial. Um, yes. We, yeah. Yeah. Because um, their their percentage of cost assets compared CPP compared with AIMCO, but I, I, I other than AIMCO is much smaller, of course, than than uh, CPP by, by a very significant uh, dollar amount for sure. Um, we're coming close to, to a, actually just a minute or two over our time, I guess. Um, again, questions that how does it uh, what would happen to our existing provincial pensions etc that's not something that uh, you're in an area to be able to address um i think uh okay I, that there's a a bit of a misconception i think that canada pension plan is designed to provide seniors with a, a living wage. And uh, as you mentioned before, that we have to remember that Canada Pension was only designed to replace a portion of uh, an individual retiree's income. It's not going to be enough. You're certainly right. You're not going to live on Canada Pension Plan, but that's not what it was designed for, it, right? It's just a Correct. That, that base rate, as you said. Yeah. And it, um, it's, at some point, we also have a uh, we used to have a sl uh, slide in here with the different pillars of things um, right. where you know, one pillar is that taxpayer supported old age security GIS for older, older gains, but that, that is taxpayer dollars. Uh, CPP was designed to be one of those pillars. Um, it's ring fenced from government with the, the money separate and that sort of thing, not included in general accounts. Um, and again, only to, you know, 25% of the average industrial wage, if you paid in in full over a long enough period of time, moving to 33% over time. And then it was assumed other pillars might be like a, a workplace uh, pension, other workplace pension of some kind, a group RSP could be defined benefit pension plan. If you're teachers, for example, I believe that's your structure. Right. Yes. Um, and then also private savings as well. So it's like a three or four pillar sort of structure that you look at it. But again, CPV was never designed to be that. Uh, it was designed to be that foundation upon which other things could be, could be built. Right, thank you. Um, 
Now there is one question. Do you refer, refer uh, talking about the letter that you referred to that that, uh, that they're asking for the actual link? But I think just uh, the what would they use as a title to search on on uh, on mm -hmm. their search engine? Uh, like uh, title or, or subject line of that we had in the letter or something. I, I can't remember exactly. I remember reading it, but I don't. Maybe recall. we can take take a look at providing you with. Um, uh, yeah, we. I don't have that available right now. Let me just. Okay. Uh, I think what we'll do for the people that are interested in that, uh, Jeffrey can get us that information, and in our next uh, artifacts, we'll we'll have a little a note in there for anyone that's interested as to where you could find that particular letter, uh, link to that letter anyway, and uh, mm -hmm. roll it from there. Yep. Uh, it is in the public realm at this point, uh, I, I believe. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, we can we can work with you on that. Right. OK, uh, we are five minutes past. Uh, we've still got a few questions uh, rolling in here, but uh, I'm good for another 55 minutes or maybe not. Uh, I don't know that everybody else is, but uh, but I, I, uh, so not yep. everyone is as enthusiastic about pensions as, as, right. as we are necessarily. But uh, um, yeah. uh, just to reinforce this one, can the federal government use the CPP funds for any of purposes for their concerns? Again, um, the funds operate at arms is designed to be at arm's length from government. And we have right. that independent board. So now we do have, again, you know, 14 percent of the fund in Canada uh, you know, big and you know, sig very significant investments in in everything from fixed income to to infrastructure uh, to to stocks and bonds, and again, those portfolio companies here in like Wolf Midstream, Tyne, and our our holdings in many Alberta companies. But again, that's we we have those. Um, they were purely on commercial terms. We're pr we're purely invested not because we have to be invested in these things. It's because we want to be invested in these things. And it's interesting. I think when people hear that, they sometimes. Uh, it's it, you know it, it's seen as uh, it, it, what people like about it is it's also a vote of confidence, right? It's, it's that we don't deploy deploy these investments because we think you, you know for other, any other reason than to, they align with our mandate. Yeah, right. And um, so the federal government can't borrow from the fund or convince you okay. to invest in a federal element, other than perhaps you might buy government bonds type of thing. I was about to say exactly. So we do, in a sense, they do, we do lend, but uh, here's the key difference. Again, we have our, the money is kept separate, right? It is in the CPP fund. It is with us to invest as we see fit. Now we still have holdings in federal and provincial government bonds, um, um, but that is um, done so purely on a commercial basis. So when we go to market, we, we want fixed income as part of our portfolio. We look at what's out there. We look at the prices. We look at, you know, What's what's a good the good you know investment at the right risk adjusted returns and just like you know insurance companies hold large amounts of government bonds other pension funds hold large amounts of government bonds as a, as a portion of their portfolio because they're historically very safe uh, lower yielding but safe so to make up that safer part of the portion but that you know we're not you know it's not a we're compelled to do that thing it's uh, it's again we're we have that arms length relationship where we're investing in alignment with uh, with our mandate. Okay, um, and uh, we're, we're running into a couple, eh, not quite repeats, but are you saying the referendum is a provincial government option? And that I believe has always been the case. The government, the provincial government has that, is the one that's gonna make that choice. It's not gonna be under the control of, of Canada Pension Investment Board or anything. No, that. not us, no, no, no. This is, yeah. uh, the constitutional power sits with the provinces, all of the provinces, any, any province could, could uh, could do, that is part of the Canada pension plan could in theory do that um yeah uh and again this is one that's probably beyond your side but if cpp and, and uh, the alberta government can't come to an agreement is there a chance it could end up in courts i think we've actually heard that once or twice that it, it, there's a possibility and we're stepping way beyond I will, uh, I will, again, we'll circulate some commentary from pension experts, which folks can, can look at. Okay. Uh, but there's been, you know, speculation that if it were, if, if an agreement couldn't be reached, what happens if you, you know, you're having a, a, a contract disagreement with a business partner and there's unclear language and you can't agree on, on price around something, where does that end up? It, it ends up in court. So there's been um, pension number of experts, uh, commentators have speculated that, you know, this could become a, a legal issue as well. So 
Um, we're happy to, to circulate some links to things that people have said, but we do that as, you know, again, we uh, take a look at what uh, some commentators are saying. So we, you know, and yeah, happy to share that. Yeah. I think the last question, uh, one of the Alberta panel members is stating in the phone in town hall meetings that the federal government is putting forward a bill to use CPP money for green energy. And just as a, another chance for you to mention one more time, the fact yeah. that arm's length and they can't really control where the dollars are going. I'm, I'm not familiar with that myself. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that piece of legislation, but I can, um, uh, yeah, we'd have to have to sort of take a look at that. But, uh, but a reminder, the actual CPPIB Act is, um, you know, to change that is two thirds of the provinces, two thirds of the population. Right. Okay. So the government, even by making its own law, can't force you to do something because it needs the support of multiple provinces representing two thirds of the, the population. Yeah, the, C, the CPPIB Act cannot, uh, it requires provincial approval to, to do that. So, yeah. All right. All right. Well, I would, uh, I think we'll wrap it up right at that point. I'd like to thank Jeffrey for this incredible presentation and uh, his extra 11 now minutes of time answering all these questions. And your, your extra 11 minutes of time. Thank you. So. <laughs> uh, thank the attendees for joining. We will be sending out a survey following this uh, session. It's going to take less than five minutes to complete. We value your feedback as we uh, look to plan future pension and financial webinars. And this uh, now concludes our webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. And have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks.